Okay, hello. Hello, everyone. We're going to start straight on time now. Um, welcome to this session. I'm Anna Pirani, the head of the Working Group 1 uh, Technical Support Unit. So we've just presented the Working Group 1 report to COP, so that was exciting. So this is sort of on the fly, coming out of that session. Um, I'm co-facilitating this with Jan Fuglesvet, who's online. Uh, he's in Norway, and he's a Working Group 1 Vice Chair. And so the session is called Democratizing Climate Science, and we'll hear about how climate model emulators add robustness and relevance to the IPCC assessment, uh, focusing in particular on this sixth assessment. So I'm going to hand over to, uh, well, just to say very briefly, we're going to have a very exciting uh, full session. First of all, we'll hear from Piers. He's going to run a quiz with you, as well as give you an introduction and perhaps explain why we're democratizing climate science. And then we're going to have a panel of fantastic panelists, diverse panelists who've joined us here and online, facilitated by Marion Ferrat. And then we'll go through um, a series of short presentations that will give you a real full picture of how emulators have uh, contributed and underpinned the sixth assessment report of Working Group One, and also thinking further ahead to what comes next. So now Jan hopefully can speak online. Thank you, Anna, for this uh, introduction. And um, the use of emulators in um, AR6 Working Group One has been a very fruitful and coordinated effort. And I see this as uh, one of the important improvements in our report from Working Group One. It has improved integration and consistency within the chapters, across the chapters in the report, and towards other communities and other working groups. And as Anna pointed out, we have a great panel here and uh, a great list of presentations. So by that, I say over to you, Piers. Thanks. Yes, well, OK, look at this. So can we go forward to the next slide, please? Or do I do it with this now? OK, good. Yeah, so what we're talking about is really the kind of, kind of, kind of way these two Nobel Prizes connect. So I'm, eating, I'm eating some things. I just swallow them. Sorry, yeah. So, so, so this is really exciting because part of the reason why the IPCC got in Nobel Peace Prize is intimately connected to the Nobel Prize in kind of physics. It has just been awarded. Yes, uh, and, and this is all about the thing, the way we make our projections. So we use these tools called emulators. Uh, 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 and what these, what these, what these are, are a very cons considered set of careful equations uh, that the try and make a, make a transfer the kind of physical aspect of climate change that is very important for what you're trying to project. Uh, uh, and if you go back in time, in the 1960s, we, we didn't have powerful computers, so the guys had to think very carefully about the way to put these equations together to try and make a robust projection. It, it was a very challenging job. Uh, uh, and they thought very well and they came up with these superb ideas for synthesizing all the, com the complexity of the way the world is work. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and basically, the, and that was why they won their Nobel 
<laughs> the Nobel Prize, in fact, because these have been hugely kind of valuable to us as a community for really understanding the complexities of our kind of science. Uh, and we are, uh, uh, and the, the reason is they are so s s special for what we're doing today in the IPCC report, and it's incredible that we have really sophisticated computers today that run on big, powerful computers, and these complex Earth system models. But in fact, if you look at the IPCC report that we talk about today, we are, we are still depending on these very simple equation sets. Uh, 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 and we depend on them because they have this good, good kind of foundation in the best kind of, kind of physical understanding of climate change. They normally project at one, one thing, but they can do that very, very rapidly because we have more powerful computers now. Uh, uh, and you can, you can also understand the way they work and you can adjust them and you can make these sophisticated kind of probabilistic estimates as well. Uh, um, yeah, okay, so we, and, and the most exciting thing about today is that we should have an interview with our Nobel Prize winner, I hope, if the people in there can do something. <laughs> the, we, the, we interviewed Klaus Hasselman just earlier today. Yeah, please. Please, Klaus, come to where? About your wish, Klaus. Klaus, come, come to us. This is anticipation. He's come all the way from Germany. Oh, oh we, now we need some sound. Um, we're talking to an audience at COP right now, and particularly Pierce Foster, a colleague from Leeds, so we should say hi, Pierce. Um, and Pierce is a great fan of your work, as all of us have. And so uh, the first thing we wanted to ask you is the thing that everyone asks you, is how does it feel to be a Nobel Prize winner? Um, I'm very surprised. Uh, I think I'll wake up tomorrow and find this not true anyway, so it's okay. 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 <laughs> oh, that would be terrible. Um, so, um, all, uh, the good part would be if we woke up tomorrow and found out that global warming wasn't true as well. Um, but that would be a... <laughs> so, Piers, in the IPCC, they used to be simple two-layer models to kind of fit the response of the much more complicated GCMs. And some of this work, actually much of this work, goes back to your sort of linear response theory for global warming and the cold start. Mm -hmm. And so Pierce was interested in what your views are on the role of simple models to understand something as complex as the Earth. I think the simple models not only really can capture the main, the main thing that's happening, and you can have more detailed models that look at the detailed structure of certain uh, ge 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 geographical regions. But I think the basic principle of what is happening can be explained very well with simple models. Yeah. So that's the task to the audience of COP is to um, to see it, what we learn from the simple models because the, they miss a lot of our, our thinking in a way. The simple models are, are concepts. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize. You're, you're, for people watching, they should go back and read your cold start papers because they're really influential in 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 how we're interpreting this mess of output we get from very complex models. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the last question I wanted to give you a chance to, to pine in on, to, to give your view on, is um, you get to speak to COP. Do you have a message for them? Is there anything that you would have? Um, the COP, the COP, the, the Conference of Parties at the, the UNFCC for the climate change that we well, I think we should simply listen to what science has been saying for 30 years or 40 years, so uh, it's not, not, nothing new. Uh, the fact that climate is changing is a slow process, and we have plenty of time to react. And I think that's the main problem, that people are not used to reacting to a long-term challenge and uh, realize that you have to change something now for something which is happening in the, in the uh, further future. It's something foreign to most uh, policy makers.
And uh, so I think uh, the challenge for scientists is to bring those threads across that we have something we have to do now to respond to something that will happen in uh, several decades. And uh, this separation of timescales is something uh, which is difficult for the policy maker to accept. Thanks very much, Carlos. Um, maybe we should just say goodbye to Piers and um, wish what? them. We could say goodbye to Piers Forster, who's in the camera. We don't see him. <laughs> but we... Goodbye. 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 Have a great time at Coffin. Thanks for listening. Clapping. Well, 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 so, yeah, so Klaus has been very well that we have a joint. So I think Klaus has been very well that we have a kind of challenge to us. Kind of scientist that he's just had given us, and I've been watching that for the first time, so I'm just kind of, kind of, completely kind of winging it too. But, 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 but the, the, I think the, the other challenge we've got for this, the COP negotiations, is to, to really kind of give the correct science and correct projection that they can work with to the, to the delegates and the policy fakers that are doing the negotiations and we have we have kind of kind of four of them here today uh, and I'm going to introduce Harry and Farat from the United Nations Sustainability Development Program. She's a senior advisor there, and she will introduce the policy makers. Uh, and, and, and basically, they're also going to going to challenge us as kind of scientists to try and provide them with the information that they want. So, over to you. Yes, I, 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 I just think you ought to. I think just start talking. Yep. Yep. This works. Super, thank you very much, Pierce, and good afternoon, and welcome everybody here in the Science Pavilion and, and everybody watching online to, to this panel discussion. Um, so I'm Marion Farat. I, I'm a senior policy expert at the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. There I really focus on, on analyzing policies related to the transformation of, of food and land use systems and uh, mitigation from, from agriculture and land use. But uh, this, uh, this event this afternoon, this whole event is really go going to dive into the nitty-gritty of IPCC climate projections and the models that underpin them. But first, I think it's really important to, to take a step back and ask the question of, you know, who is actually using these, these projections and how do they inform policymaking and policymakers and what are the different stakeholder needs? You know, what, are, what do people want to know from these IPCC projections and, and these IPCC models? So to, to answer this question and to dive more into user needs, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our panel this afternoon. So first we have Rena Haynes, who is a specialist in international climate law and governance. She's got over a decade of experience in UN climate processes, including being a, a diplomat for Trinidad and Tobago, negotiating for the Caribbean community and the alliance of small island states, AOSIS. And she's currently senior legal advisor at Climate Analytics and director of the Climate Anal Analytics Carib Caribbean office in Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome, Rana. Then we have um, online, live from the Philippines, who should be here, Rex Barr, I believe. Rex, are you here? <laughs> Possibly. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Rex. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Um, so you are an environmental scientist who has worked at the interface between environmental conservation, climate change, sustainable development, and resource sustainability. Rex has over 20 years of experience um, across environmental and industrial roles in both profit and nonprofit organizations across the world. And he's currently a senior associate for climate, go for climate governance at ICSC, which is the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities. And then finally, we have Andy Jarvis, who is an Associate Director General for Research Strategy and Innovation at the Alliance of Bioversity and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, based in Cali in Colombia. He's been working on scientific research in developing countries for over 20 years to support the goals of alleviating poverty and ensuring sustainable food systems. And his research focuses on spatial analysis and environmental models to address um, the challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, and malnutrition. So welcome to, to all our panelists. And it's great because we have you know, three different uh, perspectives. You've all worked across different sectors and different regions of the world. Oh, hi, we've finally got your ex. Um, 
So really, the, my first question to, to you all is, could you tell us a little bit about, about your roles, about your, your jobs, and about how you have used and how you use IPCC evidence of projections in your work and what sort of information you're trying to, to get out of them? So maybe we'll go in the same running order as the introduction. So Rana, if you want to start, and then Rex and then Andy. OK, sure, I'll start. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Um, first of all, let me say it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I just sort of ran out of the negotiation rooms <laughs> to come to this. So. Um, I will have to leave a little early, my apologies, but I'm really happy to be here and share with you all. In terms of um, my work and how, how I use the science, well, I guess the first thing I will say is that when we did the first periodic review of the long-term temperature goal, I was the AOSIS lead negotiator in that process, and that was really my first introduction to climate science in a very substantive way. It was a two-year process where essentially we sat with the authors and co-authors of IPCC, um, AR4 it would have been at the time, maybe AR5, I can't remember, and um, AR4 probably. And so we sat with them and we went through in great granular detail um, their work and the implications for their work on helping us as policymakers to be able to understand the crucial difference in impacts between an increase in average global temperature of two degrees Celsius as opposed to one and a half degrees Celsius. So that was my first real experience with IPCC science, and I guess it was kind of like being thrown in at the deep end. Um, but since then, um, since then, of course, we've had the special report on one and a half degrees Celsius, and I was um, fortunate enough to be a part of the process there when we were agreeing on the uh, summary for policymakers for that report, which is where I'm at Pierce. And um, I guess um, on the whole, in terms of my work as an advisor to small island developing states in the negotiations, uh, we're really focused on, I guess from, from a negotiation point of view, we're focused on being able to understand or get very clear messages out of the science. And so leading into the review process, one of the things that we were deeply concerned about was basically the lack of data on a one and a half degree Celsius pathway and what that would look like at the time. You know, now I think we have more, is it RCPs? I don't think you call it RCPs anymore. That's the other thing with the science, it's always evolving. <laughs> so at the time it was representative concentration pathways, but I, I think you've moved beyond that. But we didn't really have any of those um, pathways that would get us onto a one and a half degrees Celsius trajectory. And so, you know, in the process of the review, we were really focused on, and part of the reason why we called for the special report on one and a half degrees Celsius was be able to, to be able to generate that type of information. Because of course, it would give us as policymakers um, a more concrete understanding of what needs to be done in order to ensure that parties can come forward with more ambitious NDCs. It's, it's a very difficult argument to make that parties should be trying to come forward with more ambitious NDCs, that we should be trying to stay within a one and a half degrees limit uh, if, if we can't point to what are the actions that will get us there. And so that's really from a SIDS point of view, um, what we've been trying to get out of the science uh, in that sense, when we think about projections in particular. Um, and so it's been very useful now to see that there's a lot more specificity. I mean, looking at the special report on one and a half degrees, which is now more or less confirmed in the context of the working group one report, um, the idea that w we actually need to have emissions, uh, that is very, very, very specific and it's very useful and it's been sort of a key talking point in how we understand what we have to do within this decade, how we understand what we have to do out to 2050. And it's provided that leverage to be used in the discussions to allow countries to be able to increase their ambition. Um, I'll say one last thing, one other side of this as well has to do with um, our own national situation and circumstances. And coming from a SIDS perspective, of course, I'm speaking about adaptation and loss and damage. And you know, being able to get that regional specificity when it comes to the projected impacts in particular um, is one of the things that, that we're also usually quite highly concerned about when it comes to the science. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And maybe I'll pass over to, to Rex next. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll uh, just add to that very briefly. Uh, like uh, like I just mentioned, I oversee the climate governance program at ICSC, and part of our work uh, in the program involves establishing the scientific data and projections to bridge and help evaluate the likely effects uh, of policy prescriptions or recommendations. Uh, just to cite an example, um, what is key would be the likely influence of projections to both mitigation targets or adaptation priorities, uh, whether this will, would have uh, an effect nationally or locally, uh, given possible dif differences of impacts and what uh, will be the long-term course of action based on either existing laws or bills that are being discussed in the Philippine uh, legislative uh, branch of government. Um, right now, what I believe is critical for us is that the information is able to pinpoint possible differences, whether these are temporal or geographic, the impacts of those differences, and how those impacts can be addressed. Um, this helps determine the amount of resources that will likely be needed, the length of time for which the resources will, will have to be considered, whether immediate or long term. And this is especially true, again, given that the Philippines is one of the most uh, vulnerable, vulnerable countries to climate change impacts, whether these are extreme weather events or slow uh, onset events such as typhoons, hurricanes, droughts, uh, heat waves, uh, sea level rise, or ocean acidification. Thank you very much, Rex. Very interesting. And, and now, if I can pass on to, to Andy as well, please. Yeah. Coming? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I mean, I, as far as like users for, um, first of all, I work for the CGIR. So, CGIR is a global research for development organization. So, it's kind of science, but with, with a view always to having impact and outcomes from that. Um, working on food security, sustainable food systems, um, always in the global south, in low and middle income countries. And so, you know, if, if, if there was a loyalty program for IPCC um, data use, I'd like, to, I'd like to think that we were a gold member. Um, you know, we'd get the gold card and hopefully that gives us the privileges. And I think my invite onto this panel is, is uh, hopefully a testament to it, to, to be ever more demanding as well of, uh, of, of what we need. And, and I, you know, we are a huge ingester of information from these IPCC um, uh, scenarios and uh, the climate data that's put out. You know, we're always there looking for the, the latest data and downloading and processing. So, so we're huge users. I mean, we, we, we essentially, you know, use this to, to, to explore impacts, explore kind of it's, it's the translation essentially from talking in millimeters or degrees Celsius into talking about tons per hectare or dollars of impact. Or yeah, it's, it's the translation side of things to, you know, move, move from climate data into kind of more insights for decision making. And so, you know, that's everything from supporting governments in developing their national adaptation plans and looking through kind of scenarios of, of what's going to happen in, in the food security sector, working with humanitarian organizations like WFP, uh, looking at uh, both kind of short term and long term uh, outlooks in terms of crises that might be might be uh, impacting, looking you know and, and the and the policy implications for that, helping. Um, climate finance, for example, invest in the right things. So it's a very limited resource climate finance. We need to know, you know, what are the best, you know, what are the most vulnerable um, sectors that we need to be focusing in on and what adaptation mechanisms and options do we have that are going to work in the long run most effectively. And so, you know, agriculture's the um, agriculture and kind of food security is a incredibly local problem. And so the demand for that kind of information is very high entirely exposed to, to, to climate. And so, um, so really, it's very hard to make robust decisions without getting good data on climate. And so, yeah, we're, we're massive users. And I look forward to, to coming up in maybe hopefully in the, in, as the panel goes on, some of the demanding questions for the climate scientists of what we need. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. And maybe if I can, if I can just bounce off something you just said about the local nature as well of kind of especially when you're talking about agriculture and food systems. So how, what other data do you use or do you use any other projection data apart from you know, beyond IPCC data in terms of informing your decisions? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I remember over the years, you know, I've been working on this kind of data now for, for over, uh, well, over 20 years, I guess now. And, and 
And it was always, uh, the conversation was, you know, we always need basically higher spatial resolution because what happens on, I mean, it gets down to the point where what happens on this farm is different to what happens on that farm. And, and there's very, uh, you know, there's huge variation from soils and things, and that's interacting with climate data to have impacts. So you need very close spatial, very high spatial resolution for this kind of uh, decision making, but you also need temporal resolution, which is always the challenge as well of, you know, you need within season climate stuff. Just saying that, you know, July is going to be, you know, X degrees, you need a lot more about the distribution of those rains, the distributions within um, uh, within seasons. And so, so it's, 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 it's a, it's a, site-specific activity farming and and that requires quite detailed information and the tension was always you know we'd 20 years ago i remember you know saying talking with people in fact at the priestly center in leeds uh, in leeds university you know this is what we need and they say you can't do that <laughs> but we keep saying we need to get better and better and get to this level of of uh, uh, of specificity if we're really to make robust decisions thank you and maybe just a broad question to, for for who who wants to answer first but is there anything missing or if you could change something about either the, the content, you know, or the form of, of IPCC messages, is there something that's still missing for you? Or any information that you would I mean, want? I can jump in. Um, just I've got the microphone on. I can jump in there. Um, maybe Rex, Rex, can, Rex is looking next. But um, the, I mean, one, one of the things that would be very useful is an API. And so being able to call up that data and not just check, you know, having to go to the website download, reprocess, and so on. APIs is going to be um, uh, hugely useful. So making the data more accessible in that respect. But, but um, uh, you know, I think the, the direction, what we need more and more is, is this distributional data and, and, and issues of, with extreme, extreme events, variability, rather than, you know, I think we've nailed the long-term scenarios. And obviously, we get better and better, and that's good. But from our perspective, yeah, it's 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 only changing the result of the analysis, you know, in it's it's small tweaks, let's say. It's incremental now at that stage. But I think the you know, the big gap that where we still fail to, to be able to say robust things that can help farmers on the ground. In the end of the day, the other thing we do is climate services, which is actually arriving at at farmers fields with information of, you know, this is what's coming over the next six months and this is how you might be able to adapt. That's really putting the, the current data um, to, to the test. So we use some uh, IPCC, but also our Cordex data for that. And, and we just need more and more and more. We need to get better and better at that stuff. That's really critical. You know, as the, the world's moved on beyond thinking of 2050 and the problems, it's really thinking about how do we get through the next, you know, for most farmers, how do we get through the, through the next season? And so that's a, that's a whole new demand where we see a lot more need. Thank you. And, and, and Rex, it seemed like you wanted to come in there as well. You know, just just to quickly add, um, um, <clears throat> probably there's 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 a need to disaggregate the data in terms of uh, being able to differentiate uh, adaptation priorities, for example, for the Philippines, as opposed to let's say Indonesia or any of the Southeast Asian countries, or even more precisely, uh, what's happening in the northern Philippines and the, uh, compared to the southern Philippines, uh, and then adding to that, if the data can be uh, available, for example, to people in those different areas allow the uh, technical nature to be translated better used and used uh, uh, with the help of public information or education, for example. It's easier for us to work with uh, the provincial, the city, or the municipal governments. And at the moment, sometimes the technical nature of the data can be daunting and really does not garner attention, especially in our culture that uh, has a large population that has a presence in social media, for example which in fact can be used to uh, democratize access. Thank you. And, and Ruana, in terms of yeah, advising, advising different governments and actually be, being a delegate, is there anything else or, or do, you, do you agree with what's been said so far about the need for less technical and or more um, accessible data as well in finer grid? Takes a minute. Yeah. Takes a second. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no. Yeah, no, I would, I would definitely agree. Stopping my. I would definitely agree with um, with the comments that have been made with regard to the need for more disaggregated data. I mean, that's always necessary. 
dealing with very small countries, I mean, small island states, you look at a world map and most times you can't even see us. We get left out a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so, you know, having access to data that is disaggregated to the point where we can actually, at the regional level, we can ac actually understand what's going to happen in a more specific context um, is very, very useful. And even looking within SIDS regions, there's a high level of variability as well, even within the regions. So the more specific we can get, it, it will always only be better. Thank you very much. And, and I think we're, we're coming near the, the end of the panel, but maybe just to summarize really quickly, and, and thank you to the, thanks to the three of you for, for all your comments. So, so I think in terms of all the positive things and, and you know, what, what you use on a daily basis would be the fact that there's much more specificity now, um, that you know, you're able to provide much more leverage as well because you're getting much more, much more data and information. You're able to, to set priorities now in terms of supporting policymaking that there are improvement, improvements in terms of actually looking at local effects and exploring impacts. Uh, Long-term scenarios are pretty much nailed now or you know, uh, getting there, but uh, we really need more robust information on what's on the ground, what the decisions need to be done now, maybe a little bit more coherence and, and, uh, and sometimes a bit of a technical data that could be, that could be simplified a, a little bit. Does that, does that cover most of what, what was said? I mean, I would just, I would just add. I mean, maybe you know, I said we've made, we've nailed the long-term scenarios. They're a lot better now, but there's still areas, you know, in East Africa where we don't know: is it going to get wetter, or is it going to get drier? And you've got, you know, scenarios going off in both directions. So obviously, there's a lot to do to get more robust estimates and understand the physical systems behind that. Um, and hopefully, we can get into some of that stuff. I'm looking forward to getting the, the science nerd out on the next uh, the next uh, few few presentations. But there's obviously a lot more work. I mean, that needs to continue. But you know, more and more as well, we need to be thinking about more short-term variability um, uh, questions as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much to, to all of the panelists. And I think, do I hand back over to you, Piers? Or to Anna? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for joining yeah, us for our I guests. Thought I'll just carry on, please, yeah. yeah? So a lot of food for thought, and it'll be interesting in this session to hear about how simple models actually will inform these questions and give us more uh, confidence in our future projections. But we'll go all full circle, talking also about regional aspects and access to data. So it's really, you know, coming together perfectly, I'd say. I'm going to hand over to Jan, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, I will introduce the first speaker, Yuri Rogel. He is a lead author in Chapter 5 of uh, the Working Group 1 report, and he was also a coordinating lead author on the Scenario chapter in the 1.5 report. And he will talk about how model emulators supported mitigation efforts. So over to you, Yuri, please. Yeah, thank you, Jan, and also for my hand, uh, welcome to this session. Um, I was asked to give a kind of a small historic overview of how uh, climate emulators are actually not, nothing new, uh, but have been supporting the IPCC and other processes in these negotiations uh, already for, for quite a while. Um, here you can see uh, four of the uh, covers of, the, of, of, of important IPCC reports of the past uh, one and a half decade. It starts with the AR4, and, and uh, that, that was published in 2017. Then the uh, Working Group 3 report of the fifth assessment report in 2015, the 1.5 degree special report in, in 2018, and then finally the Working Group 1 uh, physical science assessment uh, that was published just in August of this year. And actually already in earlier reports, emulators were used to kind of make simple projections, but here uh, it is really from uh, the, the fourth assessment report in 20, 2007, and then the connection to um, the fifth assessment report uh, where they really came into play to connect the science of, the, or the physical science, with the uh, science of mitigation. And as you can see here, so in the fifth assessment report, uh, Piers, maybe if you move then, I think people can better see the, the slide. Thanks. Uh, in, in the fifth assessment report, uh, Working Group 3 actually used a uh, simple climate model, a, a simplified carbon cycling climate model called MAGIC, the model for the, asset, model for the assessment of the greenhouse gas induced climate change. Um, and it used, used uh, it based on 
uh, the assessment of uh, the physical signs that was available from uh, the fourth assessment report, but with an updated distribution of climate sensitivities. And other presenters later will, will explain how that is actually done in theory. So that is already a first connection, but of course, as you can tell, uh, AR5 was only using uh, physical signs inside, or the, or, or the, the climate assessment, or, or the, the mitigation assessment was only using physical climate insights that were actually a bit outdated at that point. Uh, for example, this is one of the graphs that is uh, supported by this climate assessment. These are uh, emission pathways that are grouped based on how, many, uh, how much uh, CO2 equivalents they would uh, result in, 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 in concentrations. And so the calculations of the CO2 equivalents is typically done by these uh, simple climate models or emulators. This is another example. This is a table of the summary for policymakers. And here on the right hand side, you can see um, here this is for groups of, uh, of scenarios, which you can see here from 450 ppm to, uh, to, to 550 and beyond. And on, on the right hand side, even in working group three, um, there is an assessment provided of what the temperature outcomes are of those scenarios. And this is this, that translation of these emission characteristics to these temperature outcomes is basically done with these simple climate models. So they really have this critical uh, role of connecting different communities and different disciplines. In uh, the Working Group 1 report, uh, in the SR 1.5, so in the 1.5 degree special reports, we actually used the exact same emulator as was used in the AR5 for consistency, and we also used an additional simple climate model that, uh, that, that is used FAIR. Uh, there, so we, for the first time we used two simple climate models, and, uh, and the challenge there was that uh, we, we noticed that there were differences between these climate models, simple climate models, that we could not explain. Here you can see the, the dark bars are the ones measured uh, or calculated with one climate model, the light ones uh, with another climate model. And so there were differences that we at that point could not explain. And that is where we are today uh, with the working group uh, 1 AR6, where there actually was an integrated um, process within working group 1 to tune these models, to calibrate them, to understand them, and to compare them. And now these models are used to integrate uh, information across the different chapters of the working group ass assessment. And also you can see the arrow to the right there to feed it in to the other working groups that are still forthcoming over uh, the next year. The IPCC is not the only format where these emulators have been used. These are the covers of the UNEP emissions gap reports uh, that have been published annually since 2010. And um, in those reports, we always look at where emissions are heading here at the top and where they should be going. And then we also provide temperature projections for those emissions. And for example, these, is, these are from the report that we published uh, just a month ago. Two minutes? Okay. And um, as, you can, as you can see here, um, of course, we cannot run the most complex Earth system models that are currently available with all those many scenarios. But we, for that, we also use these simple climate models for, with which we then can say that under current policies, um, we, would be, we would be limiting warming to 2.8 degrees with 66% uh, probability. If we follow the con unconditional pledges, uh, that would be 2.7. And then if we also implement the net zero targets, I have to highlight these are the net zero targets with a cutoff date from before the COP. So uh, you, have, you have heard media uh, stories over the past days that have already updated it, again, with the same kind of tools that can be run really rapidly in response to policy developments. And finally, besides just giving one single number, very importantly, these models can also be used to understand the uncertainty surrounding that projection. And these are um, basically the same projections for two of the scenarios that you saw on the, on the previous slides, but now the distribution. And as you can see here, under, under the unconditional NDCs and the pledges, excluding the net zero targets, we would up roughly with a 50% chance of limiting warming to two and a half, but there is still like a one in five chance that warming actually exceeds three degrees. On the right-hand side, you can see a scenario where net zero targets are taken into account, again, not the latest ones, but 
you can see that there warming is with a 50, the, the median estimate ends up close to two degrees, but also there, um, that was me, Whoa, go back. Also there, there is still a one in 20 chance that warming actually exceeds uh, three degrees, even if we do all these reductions that we actually uh, thought about. Finally, my last slide is a small pitch for a, for a, a report that comes out today, um, which is a zero-in report. Uh, this is a report from a EU research consortium that looks at near-term rates of warming. And also here, we make uh, use of those emulators to really understand the implications of uh, pledges and emission reductions in the near term for warming until uh, 2040. One question. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Jason Lowe from the Met Office and University of Leeds. Um, my question is, if you were going to add one additional physical process to the emulators, what would be at the top of your list? The top of my list would be the improvement of the carbon cycle and the biogeochemical cycles, which uh, are, I think, much, much less advanced in their modeling, or, or at least we're also the, the efforts that we have done over the past years within Working Group 1 and the IPCC have shown that there are the biggest gaps to be filled. Thank you, Yuri. So back to Jan. Thank you, Yuri, for this uh, very useful overview of history and uh, applications of emulators. And then I would like to introduce uh, the next speaker, Chris Smith. He was a um, chapter scientist in chapter 7 of uh, Group 1, and he was a contributing author to several chapters in that uh, report. So please, Chris, tell us about uh, the headline results informed by emulators. Hello, um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, I can't see the slides at the moment. If somebody could share that, I can see myself. <laughs> um, Chris, you'll have to tell us to move forward. So sure. Just say... Okay. Yep. So, so please, please move forward on the on the uh, slides. Perfect. And then next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about um, some of the, the key messages that came out of the, um, the Working Group 1 report um, that focused on, on the use of emulators. Um, so if you could advance, please. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk about the, um, the summary for policymakers. Um, so this was the, the sort of headline statements that were made using, using emulators. So this, this first plot on the left is um, figure two of the summary for policymakers, and it shows the the contribution to, um, to, to present day warming from different emitted species. Um, and a very interesting result coming out of this is that we find that, that methane is, um, is, is causing about half of the, uh, the net warming that we've seen to date. Um, the second figure here um, is a summary of policymakers figure four. Um, and this shows um, the projections to the year 2100 under uh, the five headline shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios, ranging from um, the very low SSP 1.9 um, to the very high SSP 5, 8.5. But in all cases, we see um, that, um, that CO2 remains the dominant contributor to climate change in all scenarios of the 21st century. So we still really need to focus our efforts on CO2 and, and the ultimate uh, future warming that we see will depend heavily on um, those emissions. And if you could advance, please. Um, and the third uh, main main um, main instance of, of emulator use in the in the SPM was on uh, sea level projections, and uh, this is one area where firstly we need we need long scale projections because sea level um, continues to rise um, even after um, after emissions and temperatures stabilise in some cases. And um, secondly, it's, it's not always that easy to uh, determine all the components of sea level rise from, uh, from climate models as they stand. Um, so we use, we use specific emulators uh, relating to different components of sea level, um, such as the, um, the thermal expansion that's related to warming and the ice sheet melt as, as from Greenland, Antarctica and, and glaciers. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm going to very quickly talk about where, where these results come from. And, and this, this summary for policymakers figure two um, originates in chapter six, which is the chapter on, on short-lived 
climate pollutants. And um, so the way that we did this is um, we, we looked at each, uh, every, every um, emitted species in isolation, and we, we ran simulations where um, those, those emissions were included and where they were excluded. And um, these, um, these specific emulators were, were tuned based on the results from, um, from complex climate models. So still um, really important to have um, really good um, Earth system models that we can actually use to develop these, uh, these, these more simple emulators. But why we need emulators is because we, we don't have all possible experiments we might want to look at from the complex models. So there's a very a small subset of experiments and we, we basically fill in the gaps with our, with our emulator. And then using um, what's called the sort of, we call it the chapter seven emulator, but it's, it's a two layer climate model. So, so, um, so we've already heard from, uh, uh, from, from Klaus Hasselman earlier, um, talking about how, how simple um, models can be used to project temperature change. And this is like exactly what's going on here. So we, again, we use a calibrated um, uh, a forcing to temperature model to determine the climate outcomes um, from, these, um, from these scenarios. So if we could um, uh, go to the next slide, please. And then um, this, um, this, this, is, this is in support of uh, a statement in the summary for policymakers, and if you could just click next as well. Um, this shows the, um, the contributions to observed observe warming from different categories of, um, of, of climate forces. Um, so again, we have a, um, an, um, the Chapter 7 emulator, which we compare to, to other constrained estimates from the literature. So the, these are the bars. Um, we have we have um, net human influence in the kind of orange color. We have the greenhouse gases in gray, and then we have the the, the other human effects, which is primarily aerosols caused from air pollution. Um, so we can see that we've got this offsetting effect between greenhouse gases and aerosols, um, and we can sort of est we can put ranges on on what the, that means for temperature. So we say that um, the greenhouse gases are responsible for somewhere between one and two degrees of warming, and then um, aerosols offset up to 0.8 degrees of that. And we also see from this same um, breakdown that the, the natural influence on the historical warming has been very small. So we can attribute 100% um, um, of um, historical warming to, um, to human activities. Um, next slide, please. We extend this a little bit um, for, for, the, for the SPM figure four, where we look at future projections. And in this case, we, we use this, um, this, this two-layer climate model um, running the, the SSP scenarios. And again, we compare those results to constrained estimates from the literature. And we produce temperature projections um, up to 2100 with those, those, those five SSPs. And we use, um, again, we use a constrained emulator that's, that's, um, that, that's calibrated to the, um, the, the working group one's assessment of a, uh, specific climate variables, which include uh, climate sensitivity, transient climate response, and the assessment of radiative forcing. And one of the reasons we do this is because if we just use some of the raw climate model projections, um, then we'd end up with um, historical warming that are, that's kind of outside of our hist um, historical observed range. Um, so we need some method to try and um, um, ensure that the, the model projections that we do have um, are more representative of the, the climate that we've experienced. Um, so I realize I'm, I'm actually running out of time. So if you skip through the next slide on sea level, because I've already kind of talked about that. And then finally, just a sort of a roundup of what I haven't talked about. Um, so emulators were all over the Working Group 1 report. Um, so they were used in probably about two thirds, three quarters of the chapters. Um, they were used to estimate 1750 to 1850 warming. This is, this is a case where we didn't have a particular climate model experiment uh, for this. Um, in chapter four, again, we extend beyond 2100, where the, there was not a lot of Earth system results covering that period. And um, we also used it to, um, to estimate non-CO2 contributions to carbon budgets, um, to produce um, greenhouse gas equivalent metrics, and to determine regional climate change at various warming thresholds. Um, so in summary, it would have been very difficult to provide all of this um, uh, policy relevant detail without the assistance of emulators. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'm going to have to ask Jan to tell me how we're doing for time. Do we have time? Good. So, any questions? Does anyone like to ask Chris? Piers. Yes, Chris, I can ask you one. Um, so, so, 
perhaps it was an issue in the report that the regional projections were not constrained, but, but the globally average surface temperatures kind of kind of were. So, so yeah. So I just wondered, kind of, kind of, what you thought about that inconsistency there. Well, so we, 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 I mean, there are different ways of, of doing this. So, um, so, so if the region, pro, region projections, we can look at warming thresholds. So, um, so we can use, we can use warming levels from, from climate models, which, which don't have to be constrained. We can say what, what's, what is the regional climate for a, for a, um, a, a global temperature change of 1.5 degrees. Um, so we don't necessarily need to have, um, constrained emulators to do this and also as well this is a this is an area that's that's under active development at the moment and there's, there, there are sort of a lot of people on this panel who are interested in further developing these regional emulators which would mean we could we could actually produce um sort of time dependent um scenarios of regional climate change um uh, as efficiently as we currently do for the for the global mean uh, and to include um other climate Ver other climate um, relevant um, information, such as precipitation, or, or, or some of the uh, some of the um, some of the, the variables that our um, panelists have already um, d discussed. Um, so, so there's definitely lots of work going on there. Thank you for that. Does anyone else have a question? If not, uh, back to Jan. Who's that? Thank you. Oh, Helene. Sorry, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's Helene Hewitt here. I was uh, um, on chapter nine on the oceans and cryosphere and sea level. So I was just um, wondering what you thought, because obviously a big thing with the sea level is the deep uncertainty part. And I, um, I wondered if you thought there was scope there to use emulators more to capture that deep uncertainty so we could better quantify it for policymakers. Yes, of course. And actually, um, chapter nine, and I do apologize for running out of time and skipping through your slide, but... Um, Chapter nine is probably the, the, the one that actually was was um, their assessment was um, was possibly the most uh, reliant on a combination of emulators. And um, what one of the strengths of emulators are is um, because we can run a lot of simulations because they're supposedly computationally efficient and we can span the, the uncertainty in in our sort of assessed ranges of of, of climate and, and parameters. Um, then we can produce um, sort of the, these distributions of um, what might be likely to happen. So what we can do is we can really look at what happens in the in the tails of these distributions. And, and I touched upon it in my first slide, where, where I said, well, there's a there's a sort of a non-zero probability of a 15 meter sea level rise in, in 20, by 2300 under a high emission scenario, um, and that's basically a sort of a, a, a multiple multiplication of, of, of a fairly small but non-zero probabilities relating to um, sort of uh, so sort of mass balance in, in Greenland, Antarctica, uh, ice sheet loss, um, thermal expansion, and also the scenario uncertainty with, with the pathway that we, we take in the future. Um, so I think it's, it's, it can be really, really useful um, for these, um, for sort of looking at uh, the climate risk in the tails. And, and I think sea level rise is one of those, um, uh, one of those, those aspects where, where this can be really useful. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And uh, then I will go directly to Zebedee Nichols, who was uh, contributing authors on, author on several chapters. And he will talk about um, the preparation of the emulators for the use uh, across the chapters and uh, across the working groups. So over to you, uh, Zebedee. Thank you, Jan, and thank you everyone today for attending, both in person and around the world online. Um, so, uh, yeah, if we go to the next slide, please, that would be great. So today I'm going to talk about the emissions-driven emulators, which are used in Working Group 3 primarily. So Chris just gave us a very nice overview of lots of different emulators throughout the report, and the ones I'm going to focus on here are these ones which are used in Working Group 3, particularly for scenario assessment. So Working Group 3 scenarios are defined in terms of emissions, then the emulators have to go through and calculate atmospheric concentrations, effective rate of forcing, and then global mean temperature change. Um, these emulators need to be calibrated to capture the working group one assessment as closely as possible, and that's to ensure this cross-working group consistency that Jan's already spoken about. But they also need to be computationally efficient enough to be usable by working group three. So working group three has, you know, deadlines of 
between six and 12 months after working group one finishes. It's using our most expensive uh, system models as an option. So we have to go with this emulator approach, which is the focus of today. Um, next slide, please. So there are a couple of challenges when doing this. Um, working group one produces assessment of multiple metrics. So for example, ECS, um, equilibrium climate sensitivity, TCR, the transient climate response, aerosol effective radio forcing, as well as warming under different scenarios. And working group three's tools need to reflect this assessment as closely as possible. And they need to do this for all the metrics simultaneously. And that's where things get trickier. Um, and the other thing we need to do is actually understand the extent to which the tools we give over to working group three differ from the working group one assessment, because it's very hard to get them perfect. So we need to understand if um, there are any biases and where those biases are. Uh, next slide, please. So, oh, sorry, you, thank you. Oh, whoever's got the remote. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly run through today and try and catch up a couple of minutes. Um, how we create a tool which reflects a multi-dimensional assessment and then how good the tools we ended up with actually are. So next slide, please. So if you were just doing this in a single dimension, it would be a fairly simple problem in many ways. You've only got one assessed range you need to capture, which you can see in the black bar here, and you'll be able to calibrate to that without too many issues. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll see that we're not doing this in one dimension. We're actually doing this in more like 20, and I've just put three here because it's a bit easier to see than 20. So that's where things get more complicated. We need to do multiple climate system properties at once, and in some cases, changing your emulator's response for one property will affect its response in other properties as well. So getting them all working all at the same time is not an easy thing. The next slide, please. Um, so there are a couple of options which are used for this sort of multi-dimensional probabilistic calibration. So you're trying to get both the median and the ranges across multiple dimensions, and that's definitely a challenge. So one way it's done is using a thing called a Monte Carlo Markov chain, and then that's often followed by a technique which we refer to as subsampling. That's how it was done for both the magic model that I work on and the Citro SCM model. Um, another way to do this is sort of weighting your parameters by their likelihood, and that's how it was done for FAIR, as well as for the Oscar model, which also appears in um, Cross Chapter Box 7.1. And if anyone has got other ideas about how to do this sort of multi dimensional probabilistic calibration and wants to get in contact, I would love to hear from you because I think it's um, a sort of niche um, application, and the crossover between statistics and climate science will be something I would love to explore more. So next slide, please. Um, so for Monte Carlo Markov chain, you sort of, this technique's fairly well known. You combine prior knowledge and observations and you create a multi-dimensional parameter distribution. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna skip through these slides pretty quickly, but you can imagine that you start off by sampling quite a wide space of possible responses. And then you've got to go and pick out the ones which actually may match the working group one assessment. And um, there's a bit more detail on the slides we've got time for. So if we can skip the, the next slide and the one after, please. Um, and the one after that, actually, sorry, thank you. Um, the, one of the key techniques here is this idea of subsampling. So basically you go through and you start with a very wide prior, which is not shown here. And what you're trying to get to in the end is the assess range from working group one. So that's the blue. And what we have in the orange is what you get if you just take observations of a few key um, climate system properties. And the last step we add on, which is one that um, was being developed in the last few years, is this idea of subsampling where you say, okay, we've got our distributions, but we want to make them match the working group one assessment as closely as possible. So we subsample to actually get a set which matches that distribution um, from a much a slightly wider distribution that is constrained using more traditional statistical techniques. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And so once you've done all this, um, what you want to then do is go and say, okay, I've got to compare multiple models across multiple climate system properties all at once and see which ones match the assessment best and where there are any biases. So if we go to the next slide, um, in cross chapter box 7.1, we have this table, table two, which actually goes through and compares the performance of our emulators with the assessment. And if we just skip through this slide and the next one, um, when you're looking at this table, the key thing to remember is white means better agreement with the assessment and darker shades mean less good agreement. And you'll see for um, on this table, there's actually a remarkable amount of white cells. And given we're doing sort of multi-dimensional probabilistic um, model calibration, where we need to get both the median and the upper and lower ends of the likely ranges um, consistent with the assessment, I've actually was much, much more pleased with what we ended up here than I thought we would get when we started off 
given how many um, different things we're trying to get right at once. So if we go to the next slide, um, we've now had this software working group three. So they're running scenarios with these calibrated emissions driven emulators. Um, this is used as part of their assessment of the socioeconomic transformations aligned with different climate outcomes. And full details of that will come out alongside working group three in early to mid 2022. And I think one of the questions which was asked by the panel was about this sort of higher resolution stuff. And Chris has already touched on this, but I think the good news is there's lots of activity on this regional specific, uh, specificity, which is being um, sought. The trickier news is that there's obviously lots of research still to be done, especially on the data handling, once you produce the sort of data volumes we're talking about here. But I think the final thing to sort of round out my um, good news, bad news sandwich is that the success of emulators in working groups, um, working group one in AR6, give us hope that we can use similar techniques for regional higher um, temporal resolution projections. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Sonia has to say on that subject in the next few minutes. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I don't think we have time for I think questions, one, unfortunately, for Anna. Okay. One, one, yes. one question. Would anyone like to come in? Peter. It's, 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 a, it's a bit of a, oh, hang on. It's a bit of a technical question, but you showed in the good news, bad news bit that for some parts of your uh, diagram, the emulator was inconsistent or had got worse in some sense. So what does that mean for the overall assessment? What does it mean for working group three if it's using, um, you know, the imperfection, if you like, the emulator, what does it mean? And, and, and in particular, that parameter space where you had your blue boxes, what does that mean for the assessment? Um, so I think the key thing for working group three is a lot of their categorization is done based on warming and in the warming space um, for the models they're using, there's actually very good agreement between the emulators and um, the working group one assessment. Obviously, if you have an emulator which is projecting slightly higher temperatures than the working group one assessment, you should be aware of that in the um, conclusions made by working group three. You might be applying a slightly more stringent standard than if you had an emulator that perfectly matched working group one. And similarly, if the working group one emulators are slightly cooler, then you need to take that into account as well. I think the good news for working group three is that in the warming space, which is their space of major concern, there's um, surprisingly high consistency. And the question, of course, is, well, if you go into more detail on effective radio forcing carbon cycle response, you know, are we getting the right answer for the wrong reason, potentially? But that's research for another day. Yeah, thank you. I should say, I'm Pete Stott from the Met Office. We've got two inches. Again, thank you very much, uh, Zeb, uh, for giving us insights uh, to the preparation of the emulators. And then we move on to Sonia Zeneviratne. She was a uh, coordinating lead author on uh, Chapter 11 of the World Group 1 report, and she will go beyond what the World Group 1 did and uh, open the regional dimension. Please, Sonia. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm trying to move the slides. Uh, with OK? Or? Yes. Oh, sorry. No, no, I, I'm too... <laughs> Okay, so I will uh, talk about the potential to go beyond working group one uh, research uh, by using regional emulators and I have a long subtitle about informing adaptation and assessing the realism of mitigation pathways with regional system model emulators. I want to mention, so I was a coordinating lead author from the chapter 11 on extremes. Um, we, we did mention some of those results, but I must say much of the assessment is really based actually on the output of the climate models because uh, the results here were, were not uh, yet ready, but uh, where a lot of this, uh, this work has been developed by Lea Boisch and Lucas Kudmundson, and now it's basically work in progress, uh, and I'm going to present this. So I wanted to go back to the overall structure of the IPCC assessments. Uh, so we have on the one hand the IPCC Working Group 3, which is mostly based on integrated assessment models. So these are models which are developing basically the scenarios that are used then in the rest uh, of the IPCC reports. They do include some feedback from global temperature, uh, basically with simulator, but mostly based on magic. Now, within Working Group 1, most of the evidence that we have in terms of projection is based on Earth system models, uh, which can be both on global scale or regional scale, like CODEX, and so they use climate physics, biogeochemistry, and of course they predict changes on global scale and on regional scale. 
And then from those global models, you have impact models which are being driven to compute impacts, uh, also a global and regional scale. Uh, now, I think we have some possible issues there that we have this chain, but we don't really have interactions between the different elements of the chain. So just I want to show one example where this is, can cause some problem. Uh, here I'm showing some uh, projections uh, of changes in land cover fractions in different um, integrated assessment models, where you are looking at the change in forest uh, cover, and you see that some of those IMs actually are projecting a very large change uh, in uh, forest. So basically they're assuming that we are planting forest in many locations. So that's a question that you could ask. Are those projected changes in forest consistent with the changes in extremes that are projected in the climate models? So that's why uh, I think it's really important that we have those feedbacks also integrated in terms of what is happening on regional scale. On the one hand, so if you have a regional earth system emulator, this means that if you have new scenarios, you can very quickly compute also the associated changes in impacts. But on the other hand, you can feedback those changes in regional climate change towards uh, the development of IEMs. And so in the end, also, if you have computed changes in impacts, this could also then feed back to the, I, uh, to the IEMs. Just to provide some examples, so uh, again, the forest uh, I mentioned before, I mean, you could have more risk of fires in some location, but if you're assuming you're planting forest to take up CO2, actually those forests are not going to grow or survive. But also agriculture is important because uh, there are some, uh, some assumptions about how many people are going to, to be fed, and you need to, to have realistic assumptions about how much agriculture land area you need. So basically, uh, these impacts of regional climate change uh, and extremes can be very important to constrain the emission scenarios. So I'll just really say a few words about uh, what we have been developing in our group. So it's a Mesmer Regional uh, Emulator. And so is, we have a first paper that was published in 2020, as mentioned, this work from Lea Bosch. And so the idea was to create plausible stochastic realization, uh, which are geographically resolved and which start from the global temperature. So basically, and I will discuss this afterwards, the input is the global temperature. So this can be coupled to an, a global temperature emulator such as MAGIC or FAIR. That's basically the idea. And so the idea is that you can improve information, for instance, in integrated assessment models, but you could also use this, uh, for instance, to assess impacts. Yeah. And so the main structure is uh, this equation here. Uh, the projected temperature assessed for temperature at any location and time is just a function of the global temperature and then uh, local residual uh, temperature variability. So that's the detail of the model. I don't have time to, to discuss all of it, but really the main point is the, the driving variable is global temperature, and that's, that's a really uh, interesting part. So I'm just showing you here some uh, results, for instance, for different uh, Earth system models. Where on the top, you see the, the model, and then here we have different realization with the emulator. I, I couldn't include the, the nice version, which is moving over time, but basically you can have a lot of different realizations which look very much similar to what the Earth system model is doing and we find that the properties are, are statistically satisfying. Yeah. Now the next step, and that's what uh, Zeb Nikos was just mentioning before, we have had a collaboration with Zeb and Malte about the coupling of Mesmer to, to MAGIC, and that's a paper that is currently in review. And so we basically, uh, again, couple the two, so we, have, we are using the output from, the from Mesmer, in, for, sorry, from MAGIC in terms of global temperature and putting this as input to Mesmer, which means that now we can simulate the whole chain. We, have basic, we can go from the emissions to regional changes uh, in, uh, outputted by Mesmer. So that's, I think, my last point. Uh, I'll just come to the conclusions. Um, so regional Earth system model emulators can help bridge a gap between IPCC working group one, working group two, and working group three science. I think, uh, as mentioned, I don't think we have done much of this in AR6, but maybe that could be some idea for AR7, uh, especially maybe given the, the time frames that we have to work under. I mean, we have to realize, we have to develop scenarios, realistic pathways for emissions, when we are saying we have to reach minus 50% by 2030, so we don't have 10 years to figure out what is the best scenario. We have to figure this out in a few years. Um, so the key question I think we need to address at this interface are first uh, realism or develop emissions and pathways, but also this full integration from emissions to impact, so really that you can start from the emissions 
and in the end have impacts being computed, but maybe also the reverse chain. So you start from the impacts that, for instance, you say, okay, we can live with those impacts, or that's the maximum impacts we are ready to accept, and then this tells you how much emissions you can have. And of course, to speed up research again in the context of really very quickly evolving climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. One, quick one question. question. Would anyone like to ask a question? I'm curious what our panelists are thinking watching these talks. But Yuri? Yeah, one question. So, Mesmer currently emulates uh, regional temperatures, but we just heard that um, stakeholders are interested in, in precipitation, maybe wind, at, at, very, at very high temporal resolutions. How far are you from achieving that? Yeah, so basically this is certainly on our plate. So it's actually a project that was funded to, to start working also on extremes. So we have actually now already a first version that is working for temperature extremes. Uh, and we have, uh, within the project, uh, provide also in collaboration uh, with uh, Carl Schlossner, your symbol. So there, actually, with uh, climate analytics, we are going to work also on emulation of precipitations. That's also something that is planned. Uh, what we expect, again, I mean, this is still being planned, what we see in projections is that a lot of the change in mean climate, but also extremes, scale more or less linearly with global warming. So we expect that this should be possible. Uh, and then this can be also coupled, for instance, with local characteristics. So then you would need to have very detailed maps of the soils and so on. So I think it's not irrealistic to, to reach this. I think Malte said we need 10 years. I would say maybe five years. We'll see if you have a big team of people working on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. And then we go to, to Malte, who will talk about outreach with emulators and online tools. Malte was the lead author in chapter one of the working group report this month. Thank you so much, Jan. And um, thank you so much, Piers and Anna and others to organize. And many greetings from Melbourne. Um, having been 20 years at the COPS, I must say, uh, virtual COPS feel very nice um, as well. I change here the background color of the slides to orange because now we're going from the blue, the arms of the IPCC out into the world. How do we um, use emulators to present our results and to um, transport our um, results into um, the outside world where it matters? So um, on the next slide, the um, we are um, trying to reach classrooms. We are trying to um, inform and support negotiations. Um, courtrooms are often um, and more often now uh, looking at uh, climate system insights and um, boardrooms in the context of TCFD as well. And all those are where um, emulators and where um, probabilistic future temperature uh, projections can play a role. Next slide, please. Um, of course, underpinning that is that the emulators are actually emulating the real stuff. And that's why we there's also a slight wording change over the last 30 years of um, the IPCC, where these simple models are used. In uh, the beginning, they were used in their own right, uh, more or less. And now we really focus very much on the calibration, also from the experience that we had in the as a 1.5 uh, report, where we couldn't quite explain the differences. That is now solved by looking really closely at um, how do we calibrate uh, them to the assessed temperature ranges. And here that is what also Zebedee Nicol, uh, Nichols um, described, the key graph to show the um, calibration of the different emulators. You don't have to look at the details, just the little bars pretty much um, match the big blue bars. And so they are valid tools. Now, next slide, please. What we then can do with it is, for example, ask questions what kind of emission pathway do we need to really stay below 1.5 degrees, not just around 1.5 degrees, but looking at these um, slightly more extreme cases. And um, that is here also from the publication that I think Yuri mentioned before, the zero in report from the constraint project. Um, what you can see here is that um, that emission pathway, although never really going down fully to net zero, but really in uh, 2030, it's not dangling around there anymore at the high levels of today. It is really important to have emission reductions this decade in order to um, shave off uh, the peak of temperatures and to have a chance to be close to 1.5 degree. Next slide, please. Um, 
Emulators can also be used, as previously was um, briefly mentioned, uh, to assess, um, for example, the state of the negotiations. So here, um, one of the outputs uh, that we did in the last uh, few days, we looked at all the 196 um, countries and their different pledges that are on the table. We um, took into account the India India's announcement of the net zero um, target by 2070 and the uh, 45% intensity target by 2030. When we put that all together and look at the optimistic case, which is, um, yes, all the conditions for the conditional NDCs are fulfilled. We take the long-term targets into account. We assume there's no hot air in the system. Um, and then we quantify the temperature outcomes with these IPCC calibrated emulators, and this is the result we get. Um, before the COP, we were just slightly above uh, two degrees. Now, uh, with India's pledge, we are at 1.9. Um, if you take into account the methane pledge, um, avoiding double counting here, but um, and then some other announcements that are on the table, maybe we get even to slightly lower levels. Um, next slide, please. So the um, uh, different emulators that we have in the IPCC Working Group 1 report all, of course, come in different um, uh, shapes and forms. They have diff uh, simple, um, uh, different interfaces. They have various degrees of complexity. Um, more and more there, however, linked to the same interface. And um, Zeb Nichols has here mastering the OpenSCM platform so that you can link multiple emulators uh, into the same interface. Um, and the calibration scale is, of course, something that always uh, should be kept in mind. Um, emulators are no good if they are not calibrating what we want to calibrate, which are the assessed ranges um, based on the multiple lines of evidence. Next slide. Um, now I'm just going to uh, the four emulators that we are assessed in Chapter 7 from that go from emissions to global mean temperatures. First year, that's it's our SEM model, one model that is... Um, also has a long history, um, it's based on Fortran, and um, you see in the small uh, inset here, one of the um, publications that it has, for example, investigates a key um, policy relevant question. What are the temperature contributions of different countries on the earth when you take different starting points of your consideration? If you start in, uh, for example, 1850 and look to what is the temperature contribution today, then it's clearly the US and the EU uh, who are there um, contributed the most. If you take into account CO2 or if you take into account all greenhouse gases, then it changes slightly who is the main contributor to global climate change if you um, have a more, just a more recent time horizon in your assessment, which is also um, something that is often discussed in terms of historical responsibility in the negotiations. Next slide, please. Um, here is fair. I, since we have the main author here also on the panel, I just flick over to uh, Chris again. Chris, over to you. Cool. Okay, I'll try and be quick. So, yep, yeah, fair is a um, sort of fully open source. Um, emissions driven climate model written in Python. Um, so it has a very simplified carbon cycle, atmospheric chemistry, and regulatory forcing um, calibration that's that's calibrated to CMIP6 models. Um, so we've used it uh, as as um, as, uh, as as year is always mentioned. Um, it was it was used in a special report one and a half degrees, as well as um, in working group one, working group three. And if you flick to the next slide, I can show you something um, that we um, very recently did um, as, as kind of responsive um, science. So um, so the, the global methane pledge has just been announced. Um, so sort of just before COP, um, the US and EU um, was sort of pledged to reduce um, methane by 30% by 2030. Um, and as of Tuesday, 105 countries had committed to this pledge. Um, so what we can do is, um, because we, again, as, 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 as people already mentioned, we can, these, these models are very quick to run. So we can, um, we can run this scenario in a model like FAIR and we can project what this does to global mean temperatures. So we find um, about a tenth of a degree of avoided warming by 2050 under that scenario. Um, and this was this was in, in calm brief on Tuesday. Um, and if you flick to the next slide, um, we don't really need to talk about the um, who was in control of the slides yet. Um, so yeah, we we have this um, this this very simple online version uh, that's currently a bit out of date. But you can you can go to fairscm 
dot org and and have a play with it and and, and um see if you can if, if see what what comes out and uh we have full documentation and um like as an interactive version on, on github as well um so that's the quick roundup of fair and then, then back to you uh Malte. Thank you, uh, Chris, um, and that links um, these online interfaces also link into the title of today's talk, the democratization um, of uh, the science, which is giving access to many more uh, people to run these uh, tools, even if they don't have a software engineering degree. Um, so now just over to Magic. Magic is probably one of the more oldies, um, has gray hairs, has been around for 30 plus years um, and it got a little bit of fat. It's probably uh, one of the larger simple models. It's now 20,000 lines of code or something, but um, it has permafrost, sea level rise, clath rates, about gas cycles, etc. It's used in the also, for example, in the UNEP-GAP report uh, projections that you've seen, it's used in, by the IEA in its uh, latest Gold Energy Outlook. Um, it's used um, by the Climate Action Record team. It's also as fair and it's always used in that translation from Rookmook 1 to Rookmook 3. And it's also inbuilt into various integrated assessment models, like, for example, image, message, and remand. Um, next slide. Um, and also, if you want to have a play around with it, you can have that IPCC AR6 compatible or calibrated version at the livemagic.org um, website. Um, next slide, just one example here for the outreach. These were the projections, um, just the medians plotted here from the IEA report where the net zero scenario um, from the IEA is shown to basically, um, it's in the one and a half degree scenario, just as much as the lowest SSP 119 scenario of the working group one report we assessed. Next slide. And then there's Hector. Um, Hector is um, developed in the US at PNNL and is part of the GCAM uh, model. Um, it has a similar structure um, also to the others. Um, next slide. And um, you can see here um, there are uh, quite a variety of interfaces um, available for Hector. It's also um, open source, like FAIR. Um, it has lots of workshops and seminars and tutorials. Um, and uh, these nice animations here on the side where you see the atmospheric CO2 content and how it changed for the anthropogenic emissions. Also, next slide, um, Hector has a nice interface where you can um, put in your own um, emission scenario. Uh, this interface also comes with um, the advantage of you can go to a regionalization plot, so where you um, have a simple pattern scaling um, approach. So you have the link here at the bottom. Um, now, last slide. Um, really, the outreach of the emulators, they enable that we have IPCC consistent climate inform uh, information in the hands of many. We can um, provide better informed um, uh, yeah, support for the decisions, for example, at the COPS. Um, we can provide probabilistic um, risk information for TCFD, and there, of course, the challenge is um, to combine this probabilistic global information with then the regionalization that we also touched upon. Um, there's capacity transfer inbuilt because of the simplicity and the accessibility of these emulators. And one more click, the future direction of these emulators um, is there uh, we strive to get more detail, even better calibration, and then you know, now we have to do three more clicks, um, smoothen even more the um, intra IPCC consistency, expanding on regional information and extremes and sea level, um, and then the yeah, integration into various decision tools. Uh, thank you very much, and meeting from Melbourne, and I hand over to our last speaker or to Jan. Thank you very much, Malta. And uh, I think we have to move on in the, in the interest of time. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the last uh, speaker, Harriet Forster from Glasgow School of Art. And she will tell us about simulating climate impacts for the COVID lockdown. Over to you, Harriet. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm feeling the pressure to match the standards of the speakers before me, but um, with all the Nobel Prizes and everything. <laughs> Anyway, so um, my story, I will have to warn you, I'm not the expert on climate modeling. 
that is my dad. And if you have any specific questions at the end, I'm most likely to get him to answer for me. Um, but me, well, I'm a 19 year old art student at Glasgow School of Art. And at the time of the beginning, the beginning of the pandemic, I was an A-level student in Yorkshire. My exams were cancelled. And like a lot of young people at the time, I didn't really know what to do. Spending a lot of time with my scientist dad, and naturally we became interested in what the pandemic was doing to our environment. There were things in the news that I'm sure all of you saw, like dolphins being sighted in unusual spots, visibly clear air in cities and rivers running clean um, instead of brown. I ended up writing an article in my school paper about the big pollution drop in China, but it got me thinking, what was all this cleaning up doing to our, clim to, doing to our wider climate? Um, next slide, please. So um, Google ended up releasing data on the average location of Android phones to help COVID response. Because they know how many phones are in a certain location at any one time, the data showed us the percentage shift of the population of 125 countries. These shifts Google split into sectors. There was residential, commercial, transport and industry. We found we could combine these percentage shifts with the Edgar admissions data from 2018 to estimate the trends in 10 pollutants during lockdown in real time. Strangely, the amount of people in a certain place almost directly correlates with the emissions from that sector. The global average of these changes over 2020 is shown in this chart, and our estimates showed global reductions of up to 20% in some pollutants. We later found our method probably overestimates these trends a little, but really isn't too bad and nearly had instant global coverage. You can go to next slide. We used simple climate model emulator, which my dad coached in Python to estimate the effects on temperature. There were interesting things going on, cooling from reduced contrails and car traffic, but warming from decreased air pollution from less coal burning. But overall, the effects on the temperature were tiny, only a 100th degree change. This was disappointing, but also kind of understandable, as even though the changes from the restrictions we were under were absolutely massive, it was just so short term. We then teamed up with Climate Action Tracker to look at how the COVID recovery would make more of a difference. And um, again, next slide. We looked at the climate response comparing a fossil fuel reco recovery with moderate and strong green stimulus pathways. The sort of money we're talking about here is, and is really tiny compared to what countries have spent on their COVID response at the time. The baseline is the current, was the current post-COVID-19 rebound policies, which was expecting about 50 to 60 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year until 2030. Our strong green stimulus pathway at the bottom of the slide um, was working in the ballpark um, of like 24 to 27 gigatons of CO2 emissions. This would keep us on track for the 1.5 degrees Paris Agreement, but it would be interesting to see which pathways was um, is being chosen by policymakers. Next slide, please. The figure shows the CO2, this figure shows the CO2 emission pathways we came up with on the left, and then our calculated CO2 concentration and temperature response for different pathways from the emulator. You can see that the emissions reduction from the strong green stimulus was enough to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees. Next slide also shows this. Um, yeah, so this shows that the urgent targeted investment could really change the direction of travel for global temperatures. So you can see the 1.5 degrees of massive drop and that correlates with the strong green stimulus pathway. It's really worth it, but did countries do this? Next slide, please. Well, this graph from last week's UNIP gap report shows how the G20 countries stimulated their recoveries through the, stimulated their economies through the COVID recovery. They did invest in some low carbon measures. However, fossil fuel industries and road building were heavily supported. A pathway in between our projected fossil fuel rebound and weak green stimulus has been implemented. That's 210 billion US dollars invested in non-green transport. We need to do better. So if COP26 is gonna have a positive impact on our future, the world leaders and negotiators need to take this incredibly seriously. The strongest green pathway is the only option cut emissions and do what you said to do back in 2015. We all know it's been six years and 1.5 degrees was already terrifyingly close. My generation knows that all too well. I'll just say like, step up and you're not behind the science. That's gonna be my banner on Friday. <laughs> Thank you.
and um, we've had a great uh, section of uh, presentations now. We heard Yuri talk about the role of emulators in previous IPCC reports and UNEP report. We heard Chris about uh, emulators, how they are useful for integrating knowledge and supporting the headline results and messages in the SPM. And Seb told us about the careful preparation of emulators to integrate the climate system knowledge in World Group 1 and the challenges related to this along several dimensions and climate variables and the challenges here and how they secure and ensure consistency. And then Sonia opened the regional dimension and showed the visions for further development and simulate uh, how we can simulate the whole chain from emissions to regional changes and how we can be a tool for even stronger integration between the working groups. And Malta took us outside uh, the IPCC into classrooms and other rooms and showed some recent applications and how they can be used outside the modeling community. And then Harriet gave us a very recent and important application on an emulator that addressed the question that everybody were asking and how they were able to provide answers on a very short time scale. And it was a very nice example of how emulators can be used to assess the situation that emerged and the possible ways into the future. And I think we can open for a question to Harriet. I think we have time for that. Please. Would anyone like to ask Harriet a question? Uh, Marion would like to ask. Thank you very much. Hi, Harriet. Thanks for, for the presentation. And actually, I think my question relates to the last two talks that, that we had and kind of bringing. So we saw all these amazing tools that are really being, you know, where IPCC results are being used in a lot of other applications. And, and what do you think maybe, especially now, you know, you, you're a student and, and you work in arts, but you've also done all of this work. How can those tools maybe be used for, for educational purposes as well? Do you think there's there's stuff to be developed in, in that front and where and what is maybe the role of, of art in all of that as well? It's quite a broad question, but yeah, interested in your take. <laughs> I mean, I want to know the answer to that as well, I guess. Like, it's really hard to know. Um, I think, like, definitely education is the, it's the hardest part that we need to tackle first, but um, it's, it's complicated to kind of involve uh, this technical science knowledge and not scare people off. Um, I've been thinking about how it's like presented in new, news, news and how specifically like it's spoken about in terms of like numbers and wrong words and even for me I tried to make this talk really simple because my friends are like watching on YouTube I want it to be understood um, like technical language simplified so I guess if there's some kind of bridge between science and like scientists and general pop populace who like want to who care about climate change but don't technically have don't have the technical knowledge, some sort of bridge between communicating in a simplified version, I think, will be like the most effective. And I guess you can use any form of social media, um, specifically, yeah, the news. I'm thinking of myself. I want to make some sort of podcast where this can be talked about sim in simple language. But uh, you should. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harriet, and thanks everyone. And by that, I think we have reached uh, the end of the session. Jan, and, uh, Alba and yeah. uh, Piers. Jan, I want to come in and ask Piers if you'd like to say a few closing words. Best dad and best I professor. Say, I want to say it's fan, 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 fantastic audience. And although I'm a bit biased, we pass from the kind of Great to one generation at the beginning, to the great to the next generation at the end. There, anyway, <laughs> but then all, and I, I, I think we've been set the kind of challenge by absolutely everyone today to really make our make our science as accessible as possible to get the best outcome at these negotiations. So thank you for turning up, and it's amazing we kept the time. Yeah. Yeah.